The death of a legal icon opens a precious seat on the nation's highest court. Have Senate Republicans sacrificed their integrity in the rush to fill it with one of their own? In the Lone Star State, Governor Greg Abbott proposes harsh new punishment for violent protesters. Is it just politics or standing up for law and order? And in the heartbroken city of Louisville, police who killed Breonna Taylor cleared of murder. What next in a nation increasingly convinced of a double standard when it comes to justice? I'm Greg Rugen and welcome to Watch Your Point where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, Charles Blaine, founder of Urban Reform. Next up, Tony Diaz, host of Latino Politics and News on KPFT Radio. In the three spot, longtime super neighborhood leader, Tomorrow Bell. Batting cleanup, Jackie Bally, political science professor at the University of Houston downtown. And closing us out, well-known businessman and columnist, Bill King. Let's begin. If hypocrisy were a crime, what's unfolded within the Republican majority of the United States Senate could be categorized as both aggravated and in the first degree. Choosing to smash through a Supreme Court nominee in the final weeks leading up to a closely contested election is not just antithetical to the dying wish of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but more critically represents a stone cold contradiction of very public pronouncements made by a whole host of Republican senators back in 2016 as they rationalized their collective refusal to consider President Obama's nomination of Justice Merrick Garland. Republican president in 2016 and a vacancy occurs in the last year of the first term, you can say, Lindsey Graham said, let's let the next president, who it, whoever it might be, make that nomination. And you could use my words against me and you'd be absolutely right. We've got the votes to confirm uh, Justice Ginsburg replacement before the election. And I think it is critical that the Senate takes up and, and confirms that successor before election day. The last 80 years, the Senate has not confirmed any nominee nominated during an election year, and, and we should not do so this time either. Senate Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham attributed his change of heart to Democratic behavior during the contentious confirmation of Trump nominee Brett Kavanaugh, saying, and I quote, you reap what you sow. Okay, panel, let's start talking about this. Tomorrow, Bell, do you see hypocrisy here? Look, that is that is Lindsey Graham. You gotta remember, he ran against Trump. He called Trump everything but a child of God. And now he is his lap dog. Okay, you Trump say bark, he say and which and which dog you want me to bark? Chihuahua or, Do or Doberman? Tell me which one to do, because that's the one I'll do. Him and Mitch McConnell it's epitomizes hypocrisy. What they want to say, oh, it was different because Obama was a lame duck president. I can assure you the multiple millions of Americans, so is Trump. So is Trump. But you want to rush through this nomination and forget everything that you said happened in the past 80 years. Talk about what happened, you figure, in the last few years. Come on. Bill King, what do you make of this? Were you surprised? Well, of course I was not surprised. I mean, hypocrisy in Washington. This is the first time this has ever happened. Uh, look, I hope that what we're seeing, not just in this instance, but the way this whole thing's played out for the last year or so, that the American people see these two political parties for exactly what they are, a collection of special interests that all they're concerned about is maintaining power to protect their political uh, friends and allies. Neither one of these parties have a governing philosophy or principles. It's purely about power and nothing else. And as long as we keep supporting these two parties, it's gonna get worse and worse. Okay, Charles Blaine, could this decision by the Republican majority in the Senate hurt uh, the president's chances with swing voters? 
I, I don't think so. I mean, I think everybody, what, what's frustrating most people is just that everybody wants to point the finger, and Democrats are pointing the finger, trying to claim the moral high ground, saying, you know, how dare you not honor her dying wish? How dare you switch reverse course from 2016? And Republicans on the other side are, they're, I mean, yeah, they're being hypocrites too. But the thing is, everybody needs to admit that if the Democrats have the power, they would do this. If the, Republican, the Republicans do have the power, so they're doing it. And if everybody just admitted that, we'd be in a better place. But everybody wants to claim the moral high ground instead. And even if the Republicans, you know, did appoint Merrick Garland or go through with the nomination process in 2016, and then we were here today, the Democrats would be saying the same thing. So, you know, I don't think it's affecting swing voters as much. I think they just want all the, the moral high ground claiming to stop. Okay, Tony Diaz, will this energize Democratic voters? I think it's also going to energize folks that haven't made up their mind because we can't talk about a moral high ground. Ever since Donald Trump has been president, he promised to drain the swamp. Instead, he drained the swamp and made it a Mar-a-Lago pool and filled it with his own alligators. And he, right now he's gonna slap together a Supreme Court justice. I hope that Americans will aspire to create a democracy that the entire planet can look at where the Supreme Court justice is not partisan. Instead, Donald Trump has revealed that a lot of our system is about a power grab. It is rigged. He wants to rig the Supreme Court just so that he can win an election and worse, so that he can gain favor by the small minority of, of, of really blind folks that will do anything for him, include catch COVID at a rally, uh, will sign disclaimers so they don't tell people that they will get COVID at a rally or got COVID at a rally. Donald Trump has revealed the naked underbelly of democracy. And I think most voters are gonna see that, you know what? He doesn't think anything through this is the Supreme Court. This is what the U.S. legacy is based on. We have to take deep thought at this. We need to be fair. And if you want to institutionalize hypocrisy, go ahead and do what you want to do, Republicans. Professor Jackie Bally, I, I, I'm curious, how would you try to explain this to uh, your students? Well, Democrats set the precedent, and they are the ones that are they are to blame for the situation we currently are in. In 1992, when Joe Biden was chair of the Judiciary Committee, he said, we will move forward and appoint a Supreme Court justice, even if it's an election year. Those were his own words. And also fast forward, Harry Reid, of course, we all know when he suspended the rules and changed the rules to allow them to vote using a simple majority. Of course, a lot of people complained about that, but the Democrats have set up this situation. They've set up where we are right now. And if you look at based on precedent, the Democrats have said, let's move forward. So now Republicans are doing it. Okay, tomorrow you buy that. Uh, they did it, so we're going to do it. We can expect them to do it to us next time. Biden did say that. Jackie is 100% right. But when the Republicans came to the last year Obama, they said, hell no, we ain't doing it. I don't care what you say, dude. We're not doing it. And they didn't, okay? So I, I, I'm not surprised. I, I have to agree with Bill on that. None of this surprises me. Also, look, anybody who's surprised by anything that come out of D.C. right now, you've been asleep for the last four years. You can wake your ass up. But this is not a surprise. This is nature in D.C. Okay, we're going to leave it right there. Up next, with just 38 days until the presidential election, Donald Trump makes his pick to replace RBG on the nation's highest court. We tackle the legal and political ramifications after the break. President Donald Trump has nominated Amy Coney Barrett to the vacancy on the United States Supreme Court. The Indiana federal judge taught at Notre Dame in their law school. She is also the mother of seven children and a devout Catholic and conservative. Joining me now, Fox 26's chief legal correspondent, Chris Tritico, and of course, Charles Blaine. Uh, Chris, what's your take on this nomination? Well, it's everything that uh, Donald Trump promised he was going to do, and, uh, and he did not uh, fail to deliver. She is uh, uh, com completely conservative, and that is what he said would happen. Um, the Senate's going to confirm this, and uh, this appointment, this nomination, and then she will proceed to join the other conservatives on the court to undo everything that 
that we've been afraid, that those of us who've been following this, have been afraid would happen. Roe versus Wade will be overturned, and uh, and uh, Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act will be overturned, and and then we'll see what happens after that. I thought that her her speech was very well given, and she did a very excellent job of giving of paying homage to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She left out one very important sentence at the very end of her speech. After paying homage to Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and saying what a great uh, life she led, she should have then said, now I'm going to proceed to undo everything you've done in your life, because that's where she's going to get. Let's talk about the political ramifications. We have Charles Blaine back with us. Charles, will this energize Trump's base? Could it help him on November 3rd? Oh, most certainly. I mean, I think Chris makes a great point. The president has delivered on what he said he's going to do. He has now appointed three, well, nominated, appointed two, nominated three Supreme Court justices before the end of his first term. And this is the most conservative of the three. I mean, and, and this is, it's going to have a decades long lasting impact. I mean, she's 48 years old. She could serve for 40 years, maybe longer. And so I think he's leaving this lasting impact for conservatives. So of course, they're excited. This is something that they needed to have to go into this election because we have fallen short on some other things that were promised during the first election back in 2016. And this was something she was on the short list for a very long time. Conservatives were very excited about her when they, when he uh, nominated Kavanaugh, she was on the short list then. And people were a little frustrated that she was passed over. And so now that she's on there, I think everyone's incredibly excited and, and inc incredibly excited because she has support from a wide breadth of people, Democrats, Republicans, independents. Everybody talks about how uh, great of a jurist she is, how great of, uh, you know, a constitutionalist she is. So yeah, Republicans are very excited about this. And I think it's going to motivate them. Chris, we've got about 30 seconds. Do you think the judge will have a very tough Senate confirmation hearing? Well, it's going to be a bruising confirmation hearing. Uh, the Democrats are going to come after her, but she'll be confirmed. I mean, there's nothing the Democrats can do. Uh, elections have consequences, and uh, Donald Trump won, and the Republicans hold the Senate, and she'll be confirmed. And that's, that's all there is to it. And, but uh, talk about energizing. This is going to energize a Democratic base like you've never seen. And, and elections have consequences. And if Joe Biden wins and the Democrats get control of the Senate, I'm afraid to see what's going to happen uh, after this, if, if this election turns out like I think it will. We're going to have to leave it right there. Coming up, the president says don't count on him to go quietly if he's on the losing end of the November election. You know that I've been complaining very strongly about the ballots and the ballots are a disaster. I and, understand that, but and, people are rioting. Do you oh, commit to making sure that there's a no, peaceful wanna, transfer of power? We want to have get rid of the ballots, and you'll have a very trans. We'll have a very peaceful. There won't be a transfer, frankly. There'll be a continuation. With that incendiary statement, the 45th president of the United States appeared to both undermine faith in the nation's electoral process and threaten to hold on to the reins of executive power, even if he comes up short when the ballots are counted come November 3rd. Republican leaders quickly went into damage control mode, with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell assuring the public an orderly transition, if necessary, will be forthcoming. That said, it's tough getting this particular genie back in the bottle. Senator Mitt Romney called Mr. Trump's suggestion unthinkable, and Julian Castro contended fascism is alive and well in the Republican Party. Uh, Bill King, want to get your take on this. Get us going. Well, it doesn't matter whether Trump accepts the result of the election or not. If he loses the election, he will be removed from office if he doesn't leave voluntarily. And to think otherwise is just absurd. You know, uh, Trump keeps throwing out this red meat to his base all the time. And, and everybody goes crazy about it. Uh, look, if it's a close election, there's gonna be litigation, just like there was in the Bush versus Gore. It'll be resolved ultimately, uh, and we'll have, a, we'll have a new president, we'll have the same president. But to think that there's actually going to be some problem with the transition of power, I just don't think it's realistic. Tony, we have anything to worry about here? Donald Trump has been daydreaming too much about Putin, He's been praising Erdogan dictator from Turkey too much as well. I, I tell you what, once Biden gets the majority of the American vote and the Electoral College, Donald Trump 
if he sticks around, I hope he does it because he's going to get booted out just like any stray wandering to the White House. The only thing that will be different is that once he's tossed out by security, the FBI will be waiting for him with files this thick to try him on all the cases they suspected they couldn't try him on because he is president. Additionally, I promise you, there are this many names of FBI and CIA that are waiting to arrest him if he so much as decides to pretend he's in a dictatorship that he is daydreaming about because at the end of the day, and I don't want these FBI people to reveal who they are because he's mean and will try retaliation right now. At the end of the day, democracy is bigger than Trump. Bye-bye, Trump. Okay, Charles Blaine, let's play hypothetical here. Let's assume the Senate gets Trump's uh, nomination uh, through and, and we have a 6-3 conservative majority on the Supreme Court. Could that factor in to what happens in later November, December? I mean, sure, we have, you know, the, the election results are need to be decided by the Supreme Court. I mean, and that's what he said after the follow up to this question. I think it was the following day he said that he would accept the results if the Supreme Court decided it. But I think we need to, you know, kind of, we know that he likes to change the narrative and he likes to control the narrative. And so I don't think I mean, in the 223 years, we have seen every president pass the torch without any sort of issue or complaint. And I don't expect to see any difference here if it becomes the case. Um, I think he just wants to to change the story and control the news narrative as he always does. But what is really interesting to me is that you, you mentioned it, that it's kind of eroding faith in the election. Well, it's kind of the same thing that the Democrats have been doing the entire time by calling him an illegitimate president and actually trying to, to draw um, this idea that the election didn't proceed as it shouldn't. We shouldn't have faith in what happened. So it's the same thing, just on the different side. But I don't think there is any chance that he is going to stay in the White House if he, uh, if he loses in November. Tomorrow, Bell, should we be concerned here and just take 30 seconds? He damn sure should be concerned because what he is saying is take away the ballots. What are the ballots? The ballots are the power of the people to vote. He is saying take away the pe power from the people and then he'll believe whatever occurs after that. What the hell is wrong with people? Wake up. Wake up. He's saying if y'all vote, shut up and let me stay president and I'll, we, we'll be okay. Other than that, we got to fight on our hands. Jackie, 10 seconds for you. Of course the president is going to leave, but he has also said he doesn't plan to leave because he plans to win. And of course we know that Hillary Clinton has told Joe Biden no matter what, he should not concede. And Joe Biden is listening to her because he has hired a team of lawyers to contest the results. So it's really the Democrats who are getting ready to say that something illegitimate or something untoward has happened when they lose in, in November. Got to leave it there, still ahead. Is it law and order or pure politics? Governor Greg Abbott proposes stiff criminal penalties for those accused of violent protest. Welcome back. In a clear message to voters who view maintenance of law and order as their top issue, Governor Greg Abbott is proposing legislation that would create felony level offenses with mandatory jail time for protesters who cause injury or destroy property. The governor went even further, suggesting new laws that would allow prosecution of those who organize and finance protests that devolve into riots. Critics called the governor's proposal a political ploy aimed at suppressing speech. I'm gonna start with you, Tony Diaz. Uh, do you think this is a dumb move by the, the governor, a smart move or a destructive move? He doesn't want people to focus on how poorly he's handled the COVID-19 epidemic because he's wasting time creating laws that exist. It's already against the law to hit someone in law enforcement. Don't do that. It's already a law to destroy property. Don't do that. And then he's trying to come up with things that do really oppress people. So if you donate to an organization that somehow leads to a riot, they'll define what that donation means, what the crimes are. And I'm really worried too, because you've got far right wingers that are trying to make groups like Black Lives Matter sound like terrorist organizations. This is way off the mark. Jackie Bally, is he talking to his base here? Do you think they like this message? 
He's, he's talking to everyone who wants to see a, a peaceful and lawful state. Look, with places like Seattle, like Portland, like New York, where you see a lot of rioters who are doing a lot of damage, not only to businesses, but to people and to law enforcement officers and Democrats who are silent in all of this violence. He is saying lawlessness is not going to prevail in Texas. That's why he's making sure that if you are rioting, if you are looting, if you are uh, having damage on businesses, and if you are attacking people unnecessarily, you will be penalized. Tomorrow, Bell, what do you think of this move by Abbott? Uh, I agree with what Tony said. Everything that Jackie just said is already a crime. So you don't need to create new laws for those crimes. But to go after the people who are giving money, because I attended the George Floyd march and it was peaceful. It was peaceful all day. That night you had some people, we don't know where they came from or whatever. They tried to start some stuff, they got arrested. You cannot sit up here and say that because Abbott has given money to the NRA, that if they go out there and start some, he needs to be arrested. So he needs to look at where he's shooting these bullets. Jump in here, Charles Blaine. Yeah, um, so this, Tony said that this is to deflect from the pandemic. It's not. There's a Texas, uh, I mean, a, a New York Times poll that said that Texans, likely Texas voters, care more about law and order than the pandemic. So this is why we're talking about this. My issue is that I don't like the conflating of protests and riots. If you're damaging property, if you're hurting people, that's a, that's a riot. That's not a protest. And then my other minor issue is that if you are planning one and it devolves into a riot, by no, none of your actions because of the, the outside actors that come in. I don't know that you should necessarily be held accountable for that. So, I mean, I'd like to see that cleaned up a little bit and see the actual proposals. But uh, yeah, I, I, I like where he's going. We're going to have to leave it right there. Up next, the Louisville police who ended Breonna Taylor's life will face no criminal charges for the killing. The outrage and the implications moving forward are up for discussion when we come back. No murder charge, no manslaughter charge. A grand jury in Louisville this week declined to indict the police officers responsible for firing the eight rounds which hit and killed 26-year-old Brianna Taylor during a raid on her apartment this past March connected to a botched narcotics investigation. Police claim they discharged their weapons when Taylor's boyfriend shot at them as they entered the dwelling. He claims he fired in self-defense at what he thought were intruders, not police. In reaction to the grand jury findings, protests erupted in Louisville, during which two officers were shot. Attorney Benjamin Crump and Taylor's family are demanding the grand jury transcript be released. There seems to be two justice systems in America, mm -hmm. one for black America and one for white America. And this has been emphasized by this grand jury proceeding. It bears noting that one policeman was charged with recklessly firing into the apartments adjacent to Taylor's panel to say the absolute least. This is a very problematic outcome. I want to hear from you, Charles Blaine. Yeah, very problematic. So the, the charges that were brought against the one officer, Brent Hengison, those are, in my opinion, justified because of According to department policy, they said that the officers had to have a clear line of sight if they're going to shoot. And he shot into the apartment through a patio door and through a window, both of which had shades on them. So there was no clear line of sight. But in terms of Brianna, there was no justice there. Um, I think you're always going to have this issue when you have a conflict with no-knock raids and you have folks who are defending their, their, their homes with you know their guns, their personal firearms. And you're not going to do away with personal firearms. You're really going to do away with no-knock raids because anytime you have cops who are going to show up to someone's house, bust down a door without announcing themselves if they don't have to, then what do you expect is going to happen? Someone is going to attempt to defend themselves. So it's going to constantly be a conflict unless that changes. Bill King, what's the solution here? Because everybody is upset. Yeah, I, I don't see how you can indict these officers under this set of facts for for homicide or manslaughter. But look, it's a terrible result, again, from these people, these kind of raids, whether this was no knock or not, I guess is is contested but look there's no reason for these this is a narcotics investigation you know wait until six or seven o'clock the next morning and get the people when they're walking out of their apartment this idea of going in and kicking in doors with guns drawn with as many guns as civilians have in this country just like charles said we're not going to get rid of those you're going to keep having these results this is a bad idea for the individuals it's a bad idea for the police officers who frequently get injured like we saw out in harding street here in houston Okay, Tamara Bell, I know you've been thinking about this all week. I agree that there are two justice systems, but I have to disagree. 
It is the haves and the have nots. The more money you have, the more justice you get. The less money you have, the less justice you get. This is a travesty of an injustice, but I would be lying if I said I was surprised because I'm not surprised at all. The only reason I feel that the Hardy raid here got to the level that it got is because of the color of the victims. Anybody said anything different, they are not being realistic. These no-knock raids have been killing minorities all, all across this city for years and nothing came of it. I agree with Bill, they need to go. But when you do not have an opportunity to discuss police reform, they stay. They can say, oh, well, we ain't gonna do it. Okay, fine, that's not policy. We need legal rules put in place to prohibit them. Uh, no. Jackie Bally, does the Taylor family have a legitimate grievance here and should the system change to prevent these no-knock raids or uh, just, just breaking into people's houses uh, on these narcotics raids? Well, Republican Senator Rand Paul agrees with them because he's created the Justice for Briano Act, which eliminates no-knock raids. And that's exactly what a lot of us are talking about. The fact that the legality of it, those raids are in laws, they are policies, and in the act that the senator has created, you will eliminate those. And of course, the family wants to get to the bottom of this, but you know, when you start exposing uh, who was on the grand jury and you start exposing exactly what was said, then you're putting them in jeopardy as well. Uh, as Bill said, I'm going to concur with him. Uh, they did what was in the, um, the matter of the letter of the law, and that's why Senator Rand Paul wants to eliminate no-knock raids. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Up next, sooner or later, it's the one thing every American needs. 37 days from the election, we now know how the president plans to improve our access to health care. Welcome back. President Trump has at long last released his health care plan implemented through a series of executive orders. Mr. Trump says his measure will ensure coverage for Americans with pre-existing conditions. In addition, the president says his plan delivers substantial relief by ending surprise billing and introducing more affordable public op options with savings of up to 60% insisting the days of ripping off American patients are over. The president declared the GOP the new party of health care. Panel, that sounds pretty good, but it's also fair to say executive decrees lack the clout of a genuine law. I'm going to go to you, Tony Diaz. What do you think of the president's plan? He's trying to slap together a health care plan on his last month in office. He had four years to do the work. He did not do his homework for four years because when he campaigned, another false campaign promise was that he would end Obamacare, did not do that, create his own health care plan, did not do that. So what Trump supporters are stuck with are slick slogans, slick moves, and no health care. This is a shame, and Republicans should stand up and really defend the American people by voting him out and bring in someone that knows how to take care of Americans with a health care plan that still works. Jackie Bally, is the president's plan legit? Yes, it is. And, and I have to chuckle because if voting for Biden and, and reinforcing Obamacare is what Tony thinks is being American, he is falsely, uh, that's a false statement. Look, with the president's plan, he's getting rid of in, individual mandates. He, he has, um, with the deductions that he has in place, he'll reduce the budget, the deficit by $150 billion with a B by 2026. And most importantly, there are subsidies that are in place for pre existing conditions. It's a very healthy health care plan. It's not something like Obamacare. Care of that which was rammed down our throats and is something that small business owners and many Americans are embracing. Okay, Tamara Bell, does that sound like something that you can uh, get behind or do you think the president's just trying to throw band-aids on the existing situation? Talking about ramming something down your throat, like Tony said, with the light, the, 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 the bright light coming to the end of his first term, leaving him in the eye, he says, oh, you know what, we better come up with something about this health care because we've had almost four years and we've done nothing. We've tried to cut it down. We've tried to get rid of it and we always lose. You know why we lose? Because many Americans, millions of Americans had no health care before the Affordable Care Act was put in place. They had nothing. Small businesses couldn't afford anything. So now all of a sudden, he done got the brilliance on oh, healthcare, get real, get peace. 
Okay, Bill King, I trust you to dig down into policy uh, probably more than I trust anybody. Uh, what do you think of what the president has put on the table, uh, you know, less than 40 days before the election? Well, I looked at it. it. It's just a statement of policy. It doesn't have the force of law. It doesn't order anybody to do anything. There's some people were saying on uh, some of the talk shows that he was forcing insurance companies to cover. Pre now, the president doesn't have the power to do that. Uh, that's got to be in some kind of legislation. Look, here's the truth of the matter. Both of these political parties are lying to the American people about health care. The, the problem with health care in America is the cost. And we keep talking about how we're going to spread it out, how we're going to insure. The problem is the cost. You know, we're overweight. We've got diabetes. We've got a, a, an epidemic of dementia going on in this country. Until we address the root causes of what's driving this cost, we're just going to continue in this battle. And all we're going to end up doing is borrowing more money at the federal level to spend on health care until we address the issues. Okay, 15 seconds to Charles. Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, I mean, from his intention, from when he announced this, I mean, it, it includes 35 million seniors will be getting ca direct cash assistance for health. They will be get, uh, enhancing telehealth, um, direct primary care. Um, I don't even know what else is in there, but there were a ton of great things in there. So if they do follow through with it, I think this is a good promise for Republicans. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Up next, Democrat Joe Biden's pledge to give affordable health care to every family in the nation. Without new taxes or destructive deficits, can he deliver? Welcome back. Joe Biden says his plan for improving health care would build on the foundation laid by the passage of the Affordable Care Act. The former vice president hopes to fund a so-called public option available to all Americans, regardless of their economic condition, which would cost a family no more than eight and a half percent of its household income. In states like Texas, which have refused to expand Medicaid, Biden proposes giving ultra low income patients health coverage for free under the same public option. Now, like his opponent, President Trump, Mr. Biden would mandate coverage for those with pre-existing conditions and prohibit surprise billing. Okay, Tamara Bell, what do you think of Biden's proposal? Do you like it? Listen, first off, Medicare and Medicaid have been around for decades. We have already had government funded, sanctioned health care. As long as you are over 60, I don't know, something, seven or whatever, and if you're below a certain income, you get Medicaid. So that is not the problem. The problem is what Bill said in the last segment, the cost of health care, the cost of prescription drugs. That is something that needs to be addressed and addressed quickly because U.S. citizens that have to go to Canada or Mexico to get the same drugs for a tenth or five percent of what they cost, it's, 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 it's egregious to the American public. So until we address the cost of health care, we cannot solve health care solutions. Charles Blaine, does this sound like Medicare for all light? Well, it's, it does, but it also sounds a little more progressive than what we saw under uh, Barack Obama, because he did include in this allowing undocumented immigrants to purchase health care through this, which is not something that the original ACA provided. So it seems like he pulled this from Bernie or from um, Elizabeth Warren. But what's also interesting is that he wants to bring back the individual mandate. And I think some of his staff said via executive order. So, you know, he's going to retax people for not having health insurance, which I don't think is a great way of going about it. And which is, we've, we've been happy that Trump has done away with that. So I don't think the plan is too great. Okay, Bill King, uh, you think this will get some traction with voters? Well, first of all, I don't think we ought to look towards Medicare and Medicaid as models for how we move forward because those two programs will absolutely bankrupt this country over the next 20 to 30 years if we don't do something uh, to fix the deficit that we're running. And, and all of these plans are like, let me just figure out what I can give away to the voters so they'll vote for me in this election. Nobody's having the tough conversation with the American people that, hey, you need to lose some weight. We've got to figure out how do we handle dementia. You need to start taking your sugar diabetes medicine. These are the things that are driving health care costs through the roof in the United States. Tony Diaz, uh, you like Biden's plan? Yes, because he is not a robber baron playboy billionaire like Trump's who's never lived check to check. So Biden is writing a plan that has worked before with Affordable Care Act, which Republicans sabotaged because it had Obama's name on it. But oh, Biden is worried about Americans who, like tomorrow said, 
Right now we have folks that have to cross into Mexico. They're U.S. citizens on a fixed budget. And if they don't get the cheaper medicines in Mexico, they will die. That is appalling that we tolerate that. His system will address it. And on top of it, surprise billing, we're talking about shocking billing. If you can't walk into a hospital and say, how much is this going to cost me? Just like you're buying a car, just like you're buying a meal, that is un-American. And that's not going to help Americans thrive. I like Biden's system. And guess what? He's proven he knows what he's doing, unlike Trump, who doesn't like to read. Okay, we're going to have to leave it right there. Watch your point. We'll be right back. In the congressional race to represent Texas 10, longtime Republican incumbent Michael McCall is being challenged by Democrat Mike Siegel. We talked to both. In the battle to represent Texas 10 in the U.S. Congress, the contenders have clashed fiercely on climate change. Incumbent Republican Michael McCall says Democrat Mike Siegel's support of the Green New Deal would put thousands of Texans in the energy business out of work, many in the Katy area. It would destroy their way of life. Um, They wouldn't have jobs. The Green New Deal is a jobs program to create millions of jobs. I understand why McCall has to say that. I mean, this is a guy who basically denies that we're in a climate crisis. He's voted repeatedly to say that it's not even a national security risk, uh, climate change. But the new Green Deal banning all fossil fuels is so unrealistic. And to Texas, energy is the backbone of this state. And what the New Deal would do is guarantee workers a just transition from the fossil fuel sector to other industries, including renewable energy. It's not gonna leave workers behind, but it's gonna create fundamental justice and equality in this country and protect our planet. And then there's the issue of reforming law enforcement. McCall, who chaired the House Homeland Security Committee, says he's backing the blue. I've worked with law enforcement most of my career, and you know they're mostly good people. They're serving, putting their lives in harm's way, Um, If you want anarchy and chaos and violence in the streets, then my opponent's your man. I'm not running on defund the police and, you know, notwithstanding Michael McCall's ads against me, that's completely false. But I do think we need to reckon with the history of racism in this country and how that's sometimes a part of our police forces. And we really want our police to be uh, an emblem of justice and that the idea that they truly protect and serve everyone in our society. You know, we need better policing, not less. And Art Acevedo is a good friend of mine, actually got an increase to his, his police budget, whereas in Austin, they cut $150 million. My opponent applauds that. Uh, so many people do not feel safe right now, including our black community, which feels like they're the target of, of pre- police harassment incidents like Sandra Bland uh, here in the Texas 10th in Waller County, or George Floyd out there in Minneapolis. So. Let's have a conversation about policing, the best way to respond to emergencies. And then there's the issue of government-funded entitlements. Siegel, a civil rights attorney and former elementary school teacher, says he'd work to provide the underserved much more, including universal health care, housing, and even college as basic American rights. Everyone needs to have a fair shot. And so to me, that means we need a comprehensive safety net, that we need a place to sleep, uh, you know, we need to be able to see a doctor. And these are fundamental prerequisites to a democracy. I think the majority of the people in Texas 10 uh, are not radical left. They don't uh, want to uh, join AOC. They don't want a member of Congress who says, I'm going to join the squad, if you will, if I get elected to Congress. On the divisive issue of immigration, Democrat Siegel favors drastic reform and a more receptive border. But certainly all these folks who are here working, raising families, Uh, paying taxes, sending their kids to school. They should have a path to citizenship. They are supporting our country. McCall says that approach amounts to amnesty, which neither he nor the voters of Texas 10 support. I don't agree with that approach. I think it's dangerous. Um, I think a lot of his policies are dangerous and a threat to our families. Siegel is asking voters to take a hard look at McCall's effectiveness and pose the question, has he been there too long? You know, the number one public safety risk right now is COVID-19. And Michael McCall has refused to criticize Donald Trump or or the Texas leaders who have failed to protect us, have caused so many unnecessary losses of life. In response, McCall says he's more than happy to stand on his record. Now I got uh, Georgetown University ranked me the most bipartisan member from the state of Texas and the third most effective in the nation in the House of Representatives. So, you know, I'm the kind of guy that I like to get things done up here 
I have a record of accomplishment. I think he'd have a record of, of extremism. And I don't think that's where the people of the 10th District of Texas are. Coming up as decision time approaches, a bumper crop of new voters in Texas, will they make a difference?